Atheist Nomads, episode 83. A jolly good time with Ash Price. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Howdy ho, neighbor. And joining us uh, this time is Ash Price. Hello, Pip Pip and um, other generally british sounding phrases <laughs> and then that will segue nicely <laughs> to what we just and do you prefer ash or ashley i prefer ash ash okay all right i think as well be in america ashley is much more of a feminine name than a male name i think um so let's just just go with ash in the uk it's unisex oh, okay and ash just evokes that whole ash from you know uh, Army of darkness yes exactly yeah. which i love yeah here it's I've met, I think, one man named Ashley. I love it. I think it's a great name. I think it's a great unisex name as well, actually. Sure, um, sure. We've got quite a few unisex names in the UK. Um, Hillary um, has been used unisex. Mm. Beverly has been used unisex. They, they do tend to be more feminine, but they, I have met uh, male Hillary's and I've met male Beverly's. I've, I've met one male Hillary, but no Beverly's. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, right. Names are fascinating. The idea of uh, gender-specific names is just, I find, just a bizarre concept. <laughs> <laughs> it can be helpful, uh, but not necessarily. Once you get past the point of feeling like you have to assign pronouns to people based on their name, uh, mm. then it's it's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, there's somebody I, I have to I have contact with on occasion whose name is Chris and has kind of a nondescript voice. I uh, can't quite tell male or female, and everybody assumes male because this person works in IT, and I just Oops. refer to this person as Chris. I actually have quite a few friends that are looking for a third uh, non-gender specific pronoun kind of thing going on. Yeah, I think that could be quite useful, um, especially as we start to develop and we start to understand the fluidity of gender a little bit more as well. Um, I think certainly looking that way, but I think it's, it's kind of one of those things that hopefully will develop naturally as we start to discuss and talk about it a little bit more. What's, hopefully the Republicans don't make it up for what's us. What's already starting <laughs> to have happen is you know, using they as a, a gender neutral pronoun, even though mm. it is, you know, pisses Third off a person. lot of people because it's plural. That's what happened yes. with you. Uh, you right, okay. was plural and there was the, the distinction between the familiar and the formal and well, that just all got blurred into one <clears throat> with just the formal being adopted. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that occurred back late 16th century. Right, uh, okay. I, yeah. I just find the way in which words and language changes just be so fascinating that a word can mean something in one decade and a couple of decades later it means something completely and totally different mm -hmm. and the way in which it develops. But the English language is just such a bizarre language as well. I've, I've heard it said that it's one of, if not the most difficult languages to learn just because we have so many words that mean different things, are said or pronounced different ways, even though they're spelt the same way. Uh, like the word tear and tear, both spelt the same way both pronounced in different ways, both mean different things. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I would probably hate to have to learn English as a second language right now if it wasn't my native one, just because of how difficult it, it allegedly is. I've heard the same thing, especially with our slang. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, especially as well, because there's so many, obviously, English-speaking countries. We have, obviously, Australia, uh, America, Canada, Britain, and we all have different slangs and different word usages um and you know I, I, it's great being so multinational with things like facebook but you can get into discussions with people where you're talking about one thing and actually the other person's talking about something else just because we're um divided by a common language mm -hmm. well yeah. you know it, it's fine so long as everybody speaks english but so long as it's american english i'm you know I'm <laughs> well I've, I've got a friend who he spent a couple of years living in england was married to an english woman for a few years 
and he's picked up all these bits of, of British lingo and insists on using them over here. <laughs> nice. Brilliant. Um, there's some American <sighs> language and words that are starting to become popular. Um, I don't know what the cursing policy is on this. Uh, fly for you, man. Um, okay, well, I don't know how cursy this is, but ass um, yeah. has started to become commonly used by especially younger people in the UK. Um, so ass instead of arse, which I just like the sound of arse. <laughs> I, I'm an arse hmm. fan. Yeah. Yeah. Context, obviously. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, Ash, let's let's go ahead and, and break from the, the linguistics. Uh, tell us a bit about yes. yourself. What's, what's your background? Um, well, I'm my background's really in theatre and performance. Uh, it's something I've been involved in um, to various degrees over the past uh, 15 years, nearly now. And it, it alters and changes. I originally, uh, originally set out to be an actor, and then I became more interested in directing and writing, so I produce quite a lot of shows now. And mm. I've recently become more and more um, interested in magic and illusion, so that starts to make its way into my repertoire um, a little bit more. So that's kind of kind of basic overview. I'm originally, I'm from Leicester in England. Um, I live in Scotland, and I have a Welsh surname. And I believe the way the law stands, if I marry an I- Irish woman, I get to become king. Um, that's <laughs> right. Just you have to uniting the four like Captain Planet. Um, that's I, I think I think that's how it works. Yeah, I haven't seen anything official written down, but I believe yeah. that's how it is. I, I think you'd have to uh, convert to uh, the Anglican Church first. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, our monarch, um, the monarch of the UK, has to be a Protestant. Has to be Church of England, mm-hmm. um, which I would imagine will change at some point. I don't think it's going to be changing anytime soon, but I could imagine it will change at some point if the monarchy is still around at that some point. Yeah. So, quick question: You said Lester, but for our American mm-hmm. listeners, could you pronounce that as an American would? <laughs> Leicester. There you go. All right. <laughs> it is again. <laughs> Back, back to the language point. <laughs> Words are weird. Yeah, we have Leicester and we have Worcester, which is pronounced Worcester. Um, there's a place in, in Leicester called, uh, Beaver Street, which is not spelled B-E-A-V-E-R. It's actually spelled B-E-O-L-V-O-I-R. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it's spelled Belvoir Street, but it's pronounced Beaver Street. Um, <laughs> so hey, 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 we invented the language. We get to decide how it's used. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow that okay in that that particular spelling would that be more it uh, sounds like it'd be more french um i would imagine so there's um quite a few notable names in leicester's history so uh simon de montfort um names like that kind of have a, a french origin um and it's also a very very multicultural city being slap bang in the middle of of leicester it's always been quite active so it was very active when the romans were there and it was a central hub for the romans in medieval england it was very very central um very very famously linked with the death of richard the third um mm-hmm. who died in battle just outside of leicester and whose remains were recently discovered after about 500 years buried under a car park, car park. Yep. yeah yeah <laughs> Um, so he's been reinterred uh, in in Leicester, and there was a big debate about that whether or not he'd be taken to York because he was a Yorkist king, or whether he would be buried in Leicester where he died. It's now been decided he'll be buried there, and it's just it's a very very central city. It's perfect travel and transport links all around England, especially, but the UK wider, and it's uh, a great history, great medieval history to it. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful place, and it's thousands of years old. Nice. It, it, what what part of 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 the UK is that in? Um, England, uh, slap bang in the middle of England, more or less. Okay, so a couple hours north of of London. Yeah, you can, I think you can do uh, London to Leicester on the train in about ninety minutes. Okay, uh, and it's although it is a lot longer to get up here to to Edinburgh, it takes around yeah. on the train it takes about four hours, um, driving a little bit longer. But as far as England goes, Leicester is very very central. Okay. So, oh boy, yeah, go ahead. How, how did you get into you know being a, a skeptic and all uh, into mm. uh, magic? It was actually the skepticism that really led into it. Um, when I when I first started Edinburgh Skeptics, which was the first skeptics group in Scotland, um, at least of the modern age, I was interested in the paranormal and the supernatural, and that kind of obviously led into it and finding out why and how psychic phenomena 
might occur if it wasn't supernatural in origin. And that led into an interest in magic, because there's a, a huge grey area between psychic ability and magic and illusion, where the two kind of butt heads and cross over. So that developed down that route, and I think with my natural performer's background, it was very much a natural direction for me to go into. So my interest in the supernatural and the paranormal, my interest in theatre and performance, they very much converged together. And it was, I'm surprised it took as long as it did before they actually actually combined. I'm kind of nice. curious. Uh, one of your mm-hmm. old cohorts, uh, uh, Haley Stevens, she was a believer mm. before she got into skepticism, really. Uh, was um, it the same for you? Yes, actually. Um, I was... Religion itself, I was, I was, I guess you'd call me a, maybe an agnostic theist or agnostic deist or something right up to my late teens. Mm. That kind of disappeared. But belief in ghosts and the supernatural, that continued w- until around seven years ago, uh, when mm. I was actually working for a ghost tour. And my first time going on the ghost tour itself, I was really quite scared. And I believed the story that I was being told. And I asked a few of the guides, have you ever experienced anything paranormal and supernatural? And some of them said, yeah, 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 I had. And others went, well, no, it's just, I don't believe it. And (laughs) over the course of a couple of years of working there, you start to see people reacting to certain things and why they react to certain things. And I started looking a little bit more at the research that was being done and the information out there. And it was, I I very much credit the ghost tour with giving me my skepticism, really. I think being in the middle of that environment made me question it a little bit more than if I hadn't been so actively involved. Nice. Okay, and so with the, with this ghost hunting thing, uh, I've I've been to England, and when I was there, one thing one of the locals told me was that every house in England is haunted. <laughs> um, <laughs> that that's um not something I'd necessarily go along with. Okay. Uh, obviously for obvious reasons. Uh, but I, I've actually, I've never actually heard that. I've never heard that said. Uh, oh. I've heard it's quite common to say older houses are, are haunted, and every city has at least one haunted pub. And I think in Edinburgh, um, <laughs> there's there's the most haunted pub in Scotland exists in about three different pubs. Uh, <laughs> so there, there's lots and lots of supernatural history in in the UK. There was a lot of it. Edinburgh has got a lot of ghost stories to it. Um, Leicester and all the country, uh, all of the cities around the country, have got their own ghost stories. And there was a a survey done a while ago to try and find the most haunted city in Europe. And Edinburgh has been trying to, well, some areas in Edinburgh have been trying to promote Edinburgh as the most haunted. It's not. The survey that was done was asking people to report anomalistic occurrences, uh, whether or not they believe they were supernatural or not, <clears throat> um, is what I believe it was done as. And York came out on top as having the most anomalistic occurrences reported per year. And that topped both the British and the European lists of most haunted cities. So I believe that's called Old York. <laughs> no, it's just proper York. Yeah. I, that's what it's, it's proper York. That's how it's correctly pronounced. Because we have New York, New York over here. Yeah, but you know about new things. They're never as popular as the classics. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> obviously, because nine, pe- nine million people can't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an uh, argument of populum sneaking in? <laughs> And, and, you know, the, the UN did have to pick one York to have as their, their capital, and they chose yeah. the new one. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. I'm not jealous. I'm not, I'm not jealous. <laughs> I'm just disappointed. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've, you've uh, taken quite a lot of our names, haven't you? You've got New Hampshire, you've got New Jersey. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything a- good about the new or old Hampshire. Um, yeah. I haven't really spent much time in Hampshire, to be honest. Um, although I'm, you know, I'm a little bit upset that you didn't decide to go with New Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the only thing, no, that's no, fuck it, that's Vermont. <laughs> I don't know anything about uh, New Hampshire. I, I, mean, I don't either. Um, I thought there was a big ice cream factory there, Ben and Jerry's, but no, that's Vermont. Yeah. Um, so it, fuck it, we could le- lose New Hampshire. Yeah, and I think Sorry, New Hampshire kind of wants to keep it that way. With with people just not knowing or thinking about them. Oh, they're the weird state. That's right. They have the motto "Live free or die." Yeah. Uh, they don't. They, you don't even have to wear a seatbelt there. Wow, that sounds like an action movie waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> they are simultaneously like the most libertarian and progressive state. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's crazy. Weird. 
Ah, I suppose it is also how you define libertarian. I did one of those politics quizzes recently um, to find out which political party I should vote for. Thankfully, it didn't say conservatives, um, but it kind of put me in left-wing libertarian, um, which about doesn't kind of get discussed. Libertarian tends to be, I think, people think of libertarian as you tend to think more of the right wing. Um, but libertarianism, I guess, is a spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. And I end up left-wing libertarian. Um, not that I have any idea what that actually means, um, and it's not really impacted who I'm going to be voting for in the coming election. Um, but it was a fun five minutes. Um, and it was a proper internet <laughs> quiz as well. It wasn't any of this bull, uh, bu BuzzFeed nonsense. I um, almost got the wrong words there, but that mistake would probably have been accurate too. <laughs> so will you and your mustache be voting in the, in the next election? Yes. Unfortunately, my mustache isn't uh, registered to vote because mm. it's, uh, it's, it's under 18. Um, and it's uh -huh. been causing a bit of bit of a stink about that it's not happy about that um mm. my mustache uh keeps insisting it wants to vote for ukip so it's probably a good thing it's not got the permission to vote mm. uh but yeah i'm i'm going to be voting and it's it's gonna be a very interesting election here actually because no one really knows what way it's going to go mm. i know in america it's you've got the kind of a two-party system i think do you have kind of independence as well who can stand we do but they Is don't that how it for anything they yeah. don't care for anything well in the uk until very recently, it was a, it wasn't quite a two party race, but it was really for the past eight years, it's been between the Tories and Labour, Tories being conservative. Um, but we also have other parties such as the Liberal Democrats who were formerly, half of them were formerly the Liberals and the other half were formerly the, um, Social Democratic Party, I think, before they merged. And then we've got groups like UKIP and we've got groups like BNP, um, who don't tend to do very well. UKIP are interestingly, uh, worryingly on the rise. Um, we've got, up here in Scotland, we've got the SNP, uh, down in Wales, there's, uh, Plaid, uh, which is their local, uh, their national, uh, party. Uh, so there's quite a lot of options. And then there's the Green Party as well, that people, it's getting quite popular. So no one quite knows, I think, how this election's going to go. And from speaking to people, the attitude seems to be, for many people, that Labour are probably going to win, but, have such small numbers are going to be in a minority minority government that they'll have to rely on other parties like maybe the SNP to prop them up when it comes to votes on uh, on topics. So it's going to be very very interesting um, and just to see how it goes because I don't think any party is going to end up with a majority after the next election. I mean the last one was a bit of a mess well, as it was. Which was UKIP doesn't get uh, any big votes. Um, I've heard well, some really bad racist things about them. Yeah, UKIP, uh, United Kingdom Independence Party, started in, I believe it started in the early 90s, around about then, might be the 80s. And originally, it, it, its its sole platform was removal from the European Union. And that's kind of changed and altered. And one of the founders of UKIP, one of the chaps who started it, has recently come out and you know, distance himself from them, saying, no, it's now a racist party, I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, criticism of UKIP and the other night there was a documentary on Channel 4 which imagined a world in which UKIP won the election um, and it was even as even as a, a lefty I found it as a little bit too much propaganda um, and a bit problematic but it was still interesting nonetheless that UKIP have got such attention that it warranted a one of the national television channels producing this documentary obviously but um, they've they've had a I, I know they have a, a lot of uh bad words to say about uh, all, all of the the people that have immigrated to the UK. Well, that, uh, I mean, they, that's the thing. Yeah. And as, take them out or keep them out. Well, I mean, as a, uh, a lefty and a, a rationalist and a skeptic, well, I consider myself a rationalist, um, UKIP do like to say that they're not anti-immigration, particularly they're only anti- uh, illegal immigration and they want to put limits on the number of people who can immigrate or emigrate here. But then you hear some of the things that their members come out with, some of the things their supporters come out with, and UKIP don't seem to have any solid actual policies. That's one of the biggest problems. They don't really seem to have anything they can bring to the table in terms of legitimate policies. Mm. Um, but they certainly, they have been presented and they seem to come across as quite a, uh, well, and sometimes racist and homophobic. They've, they, they try to blame the bad weather, or at least one member of UKIP. Uh, one of the uh, members tried to blame the bad weather on gay marriage. <laughs> As one would, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, yes. <laughs> so basically um, they're the British version of the Tea Party. Yeah, I think I think I would probably 
say that's not an unfair comparison. Um, yeah, at least the closest equivalent. Yeah, I think I think for the American listeners, that's a good way to think of it. Obviously, there are differences, and there's a lot there, and it's never as black and white as it may seem. But I think, yeah, I think that's uh, for certainly for the American listeners, that's a good way of comparing it. But I would say that I'm a lefty. <laughs> <laughs> So you're you're biased against them? Um, no, no, I'm not particularly <laughs> biased against them, really. Um, just I just don't necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I just don't necessarily agree with some of the ways in which they're presenting themselves um, and some of their positions on things. Um, I have no desire to get out of the out of the EU, for example, um, mm. and I don't think immigration is the big threat some people like to make it out to be, um, but. You know, as far as outright um, racial arguments go, you get you've got groups like the EDL, the English Defence League, who are very anti-Islam, or they say they're anti-extremist Islam. Um, but again, if you speak to members, there's a very worrying tone of racism within there um, to the extent where even the founder of e- of the EDL stepped back and left. Um, wow. So it's it's very very it's, it's very very interesting, and you know, this is just my opinion on it because. Obviously, the people are going to have different opinions. They're going to disagree with me vehemently. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it is a very interesting time for British politics right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. It will be. May 8th, we will have an idea. Um, I'm guessing Labour minority uh, government calling upon groups like Plaid and the SNP um, for support. That's what I think is going to happen. And then we'd, what, what do you think is going to come from the... The the Scottish ref uh, not reformation. About Scott- right? Scottish oh, yeah, yeah, we, we we yeah we, we had well we had that that was last September right. But yeah. th- there, uh, there was there was talk that of uh, you know giving greater autonomy to Scotland, and then there was some, uh, yeah. also some talk after that of well maybe well, England I, I, should get some of that some of those rights as well. Well, well again, um, depending on who you speak to, whether or not they are a no supporter or a yes supporter, you'll either hear that what we've been granted is fantastic or what we've been granted is not enough. Um, for me, the one big thing that would have switched me to a no voter, because uh, I, I ended up going with yes, um, one big thing that would have switched me to a no voter is if we'd been guaranteed complete autonomy over our welfare system. Because, uh, at least in practice, Scotland tends to look a little bit more left-leaning again people would argue and debate that that point um <clears throat> but certainly the scottish government have done things that are beneficial to the people we've now got free prescription medication free university education um when the bedroom tax was brought in they tried to try and make sure it impacted scotland as little as possible I'm and sorry, i would really wait, bed, bedroom tax well that's not the official term for it it's technically not a tax um basically what was happening is um people who had, for example, if, you know, you live by yourself and you had two bedrooms and you were in receipt of benefit, oh. um, you were effectively not being able to get benefit to cover that cost of that extra room. It was a case of, hey, you should just move, basically. And oh. that has been very, very unpopular. And it's not been something people have liked very much. I mean, I know we've got to try and cut costs somehow. We've got to try and save money somehow. But the bedroom tax was very, very unpopular um across the uk really that was to encourage poor people to move to uh smaller housing or to encourage getting roommates um probably both huh. it was basically a case of if you've got a room that's not being used why should you have that room yeah all right hmm. odd yeah it, it was and I mean, from what i understand um scotland tried to fight against it as much as they could and uh, but it's not just a scottish thing the rest of the uk the general people were generally against the idea of it anyway. Um, so it wasn't a very nice thing, but we've got a right-wing government in, so yeah, what do you expect? Again, my left-wing bias is showing that I much shouldn't. That's very, very <laughs> irrational and unskeptical of me. But I think, you know, as human beings, we do have these natural biases that are sometimes difficult to uh, not not voice. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Uh, let's let's uh, change... Yeah, tracks. It's quite a lot, quite a long discussion on politics, of which I'm probably completely <laughs> wrong on. Uh, talk to us a bit about the the paranormal investigations you did. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I've not been on that t- a great deal um, myself. Uh, Haley Stevens is is one of the most active 
people I know as far as investigations go. Um, but I've been on a few, and I've been involved in a couple of... Uh, well, there was one large-scale one. Um, a few years ago, there was a competition to find the most convincing ghost photograph in the world, and that turned out to be at Tantallon Castle, just outside of Edinburgh. So I went along with the photographer and the uh, the chap who was running the the competition, the investigation, Richard Wiseman, and we kind of just went down to Tantallon to have a look at what was causing that. And the picture, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it was a photograph taken looking up at the castle, and there was this ghostly figure in one of the one of the stairwells. Nice. And we went up to have a look at it, and lots of people, lots of skeptics especially, felt that it was one of two things. If it wasn't a ghost, it was either pareidolia, because uh, which is where we kind of see faces and shapes in random patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was light able to get in, and the brickwork and the stonework was very similar to a face colour, um, so it could have been that. The other option was it was just maybe a tourist coming down the stairs, and it is an open tourist attraction. Mm. And so we did go along to have a look, and the, the Paradolia explanation pretty quickly wasn't forthcoming. It wasn't, it really didn't seem practical. There was, there was too much, there would have been too much light, really, to have singled out this little facial shaped section. Mm. And, uh, so we had a, we had a, a bit of a play around and, uh, Richard kind of moved around at different positions on the stairwell as we looked up with the camera in the same position, um, to try and, try and capture it. And we did get quite a similar image. Mm. And people like to point out that the image is, well, it's quite a haggard face and the eyes and the facial feature are a bit distorted. Well, if you look at the picture, there's a wonderful little photographic coincidence there where the eyes and the face, facial features all actually line up with the grating in front of the open area, um, in front of the open window, uh, which kind of distorted them a little bit. So that was really, really interesting to actually just go <laughs> along and see someone like Richard Wiseman at work, who's a wonderful, wonderful uh, person who's done a lot of kind of research in this area. And uh, if you've not read any of his books, I, you know, Get Paranormality. That's a great little read. Quirkology, these are all wonderful things. Uh, so that was probably one of the larger scale ones that I've been on. And I mean, I've done a few radio interviews as well with people where people have called in and explained their paranormal experiences. And I've tried my best to answer them. But the difficulty with answering something like that over the phone is I have no real way of of kind of being there, of looking at what's happened, of understanding the exact situation they were in when they allegedly experienced this paranormal activity. So it's very, very difficult for me to say anything concrete about that. And even if I was to go and have a look, it would still be difficult to see it, give anything concrete because the occurrence may have been two, three, four, five, ten, twenty years ago. I should think so. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, <laughs> hard to go back. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's just, it is interesting. It is fascinating to just see these types of things. Um, and in Edinburgh, especially, there were a lot of ghost stories that go on. There's a lot, there's been, there was an, an investigation in 2001 into the South Bridge Vaults, which is a section of the old town of Edinburgh. And they're kind of these underground vaults. Well, they're underground depending on where you stand. If you stand on the South Bridge, they're underground. If you stand in the Cowgate, they're above you. Uh, so I was always interesting when I took people on the tours, when I used to, be a part of I'd say ladies and gentlemen we're going to go up to the underground vaults and uh, there, was all, there was some investigation done into the underground vaults uh, in 2001 to look at the what might be the causes of haunted experiences not necessarily hauntings but the causes of haunting experiences and the results were really really interesting the general results then tended to suggest that maybe something like sensory deprivation was at work because when people were going from well lit welcoming corridors into dark, large, cold vaults and rooms. Um, and also maybe their own pre-existing beliefs maybe had some impact. So it was just, it was really, really interesting. But unfortunately, the, to my knowledge, there's not a massive amount of uh, kind of li- mainstream scientific research done into the paranormal and ghosts. You have a few areas in the UK, the uh, Goldsmith Univer- uh, College, sorry, in London, have an anomalis- anomalistic psychology department that kind of look at the psychology of anomalous experiences you know that, um, that would make really good sense though you know if you're going from a, a really well-lit open area to a cold dark area you're kind of cranking up your senses and and you mm-hmm. might be open to suggestion or, or looking for things mm-hmm. yeah ex- exactly um but the paranormal is just i think a fascinating topic um generally and 
it's just a lovely, lovely thing to be interested in, really. I've always loved the paranormal and ghosts. Even when I was a believer in the paranormal, I was even a, I loved it. Favorite film as a child was Ghostbusters. Um, <laughs> you know, I used to, when I was a, a kid, I think the first time I investigated in inverted, inverted quotes, um, was, uh, <laughs> I was about, 10 years old and we had this park and there used to be a train that used to run through the park and for some reason we all believed at one point the train had derailed and crashed and that's why the train tracks were no longer there they just got rid of them uh so we decided to investigate the goings on uh, and see if there was a ghost train coming through so we walked up into the what's known as the rally banks and we decided that if a ghost train came through then it would leave tracks so we need to put something down to to see if it leaves tracks we'd put talcum powder um, probably not environmentally friendly, covered talcum <laughs> powder on the, on these rally banks. And then we'd come back the next day and see if there were any tracks. And of course, there, there wasn't any train tracks. Uh, mm. But in our young minds, we didn't realize that if tracks could be made, they'd be made in the dirt that was there anyway. And we True. didn't really need to put down the talcum powder. Um, but I think that was the first time I really looked into ghosts and the paranormal. Oh, and my man. granddad was... Sorry. Oh, I, I was yeah. just going to mention that uh, my first ghost movie that i remember was amityville horror which put the scared the living shit, shit out of me yes um I, I think first proper horror film i watched was about 11 years old i think it was nightmare on elm street uh, i was you know five or six <laughs> yeah yeah my parents wouldn't let me watch anything too scary uh party political broadcasts were about as frightening as i was allowed to get <laughs> scariest film i ever saw was the changeling um not the recent um Blockbuster, but the 1970s George C. Scott film, and it just it scared the crap out of me. This bit where a, a wheelchair just rolls itself to the top of the stairs, and this is me as a grown man. Um, I was just absolutely petrified of that. It just really scared me. As someone, as an adult who doesn't believe in the paranormal, either, the film just got me. There's a movie called Creep Show. I think Stephen King had something to do with it. Uh, like hmm. late 70s or early 80s. It was a whole bunch of little vignettes, little small movies, all put together. And at about age nine or 10, that scared the crap out of me. Most of it was like insects or getting uh, forcibly drowned. And even as an adult, that one still kind of creeps me out. Never seen that. Haven't seen that. Should check it out. Hmm. Creep show. I think I might do. Yeah. Although, I mean, I only got around to watching Pit and the Pendulum the other night. For the first time. That night. That wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Let's take a quick break from the interview to hear from the Unbuckling the Bible Belt podcast. I'm Seethan Heathen. And I'm Joe Kendick. From the Unbuckling the Bible Belt podcast, coming to you out of Nashville, Tennessee. If you want to hear a couple of Southern boys get their take on atheism, secularism, and the fight to keep religion out of the public sphere, come check us out at unbucklingblog.wordpress.com. And now back to the interview. I'm always curious about uh, people from other countries and their religious upbringing, though. Mm-hmm. Um... Did you have one? Um, I had a very Is it the, loose. the usual washed, washed up, kind of cello, not much there? Yeah, I had a very kind of loose, uh, kind of Church of England-ish upbringing. I, I went to Sunday school, I know that much, from what I remember. Um, and I, I apparently, I would go back to my godmother after Sunday school every Sunday, and I would quiz her and question her and say, well, why doesn't this make sense? And what's wrong here? And why is this an issue? <laughs> um, which, which I was told a couple of years ago I used to do. Uh, although I, I, I never really had a strong belief mm -hmm. in a deity. Um, I kind of had a loose, you know, maybe there is something. And because being, you know, British Church of England, so it was naturally, if there is a God, it's you know, probably the Christian God. That's the one, uh, the God of the Bible. Um, but there was, it was never really a, a big thing. I don't recall ever really praying um, or anything like that. If, and if, if there was, is a God, he's obviously pale and speaks English slowly. Yeah, exactly, with a nice white beard. Um, that, mm. was the, that, was the, that was about as far as my belief really went in a, a deity. Um, I mean, but Britain very much, <clears throat> despite the fact that we on paper appear to have quite a large Church of England and Christian numbers, um, that kind of varies, and there was a big push during the last census, the Humanist Society pushed during the last census, to tell people, look, if you don't believe in God, say so, because it, mm. it it seems that a lot of people, whether they believed in God or not, were just ticking Church of England, because that's kind of what you do. Um, and so that was a big drive to try and get people to say, look, no, if you don't believe in a God, don't tick Church of England, take, tick no belief, 
or whatever yeah. the option was. Um, <clears throat> and across the UK, non-religion is quite a large number. I mean, in, in Scotland alone, I think, I, I, a colleague of mine, Keir Little, posted up some information the other day which suggested that over 50% of people in Scotland are non-religious. Wow. Now, of course, that includes atheists, agnostics, agnostic theists, and uh, so it's not necessarily over 50% atheistic, but it's certainly over 50% non-religious. And I think in England, I think the figures are around 20, 25%, something like that. Um, and across the UK, I think it's about 20, 25%. And even then, you know, this is the thing when you, when I see uh, people and, you know, news pundits on, on YouTube from, from America talking about religion and talking about its impact. Considering America's supposedly a secular society, you seem to have, at least from an outside point of view, religion quite deeply ingrained in areas like politics when it maybe shouldn't be um, politicians talking about God and power and power above. Whereas in the UK, it's completely different. Uh, when Tony Blair, who we now know was quite a devout Catholic, uh, was prime minister, his his speechwriter kind of stepped forward and said, you know, we don't do God. And even now, uh, the three main parties in the UK, Conservative, Liberal Democrats and Labour Party, of them, only one of them is actually an admitted Christian. That's David Cameron, leader of the Conservative Party. Both Ed Miliband from Labour and Nick Clegg from the uh, Liberal Democrats are both admitted atheists. Mm, and nice. this has had no impact on them. Um, two of the three of the big political leaders in the UK are, you know, open atheists. And I don't know, would that, if it turned out that the vice president uh, was an atheist, how would the reaction be over there? Uh, pitchforks, torches. Yeah. Right. I, See, I, I honestly think he would be assassinated. Really? That, that's, wow. That it's just it's just so very different. And we are. I'm not saying that there's like a, a th you know a ton of nuts over here, but I think that uh, especially with all of the you know Muslims, you know all the evil Muslims in the world, and you know the Christians coming out thinking that you know we need to firebomb everything. That yeah, if there was an atheist in the White House, he would probably be. He would be probably shot. Wow. See, very different over here. I mean, we are technically, on paper, we are technically a Christian country. Yeah. The head of state has to be a Christian, specifically Protestant. Um, and we do still have, on the books, um, a legal requirement for act of daily worship in schools with a predominantly Christian flavor, but that tends to get ignored. Um, and we do have... Some groups, we have some, in Scotland right now, there's a big push by some creationist groups to try and get creationism taught, specifically young earth Christian creationism taught alongside evolution. And we have a, a creationist museum down in England and we have a creationist zoo down there. <clears throat> and I think the UK, um, faction of Answers in Genesis is actually my hometown of Leicester, I think that is. Uh, so well, we do have people like that. And we also have, um, organizations that try to stand for marriage and tend to have a Christian flavor. Um, whereas you guys in America have had the issue with the bakers, uh, the cake makers who weren't <laughs> who, who, with the, that whole issue. We've had something similar with a and b owner, Bed and Breakfast, for those of hmm. who might not know Bed and Breakfast. Um, I, I think it's quite a uniquely British thing. No, we um, have them here as well. Of, oh, we yeah, have them here. Fantastic. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. That's my showing my ignorance there. But, yeah, we had a and b owner who refused to allow a, a homosexual couple to share a room or share a bed, a double bed. <laughs> and that went to court and they were basically told, nope, you're discriminating. Can't do that. Nice. Um, so we, we do still have groups like that, but even the majority of religious people I know within the UK are, are very much a case of, oh, will you lot just shut up, please? <laughs> it's a very British thing. It's like, we don't talk about religion. No, no, no. That's kept for, for, yeah. It's, it's not as made, it's not made as big of a public display. Yeah. Maybe. I know I know that the uh, the ACE, the Accelerated Christian Education, has been trying to make a big push over in in the UK, trying to get. I, I can't really say too much about that. I have some friends who went through ACE, but I myself don't know too much about it. Um, I know there has been a push for it. I know there are a few schools that that use it and operate under it, but I I'm very I'm kind of ignorant on the matter of exactly how widespread that is. Yeah, I don't think it's very widespread, but I know they're trying to make a push to get it over there more. more which it's pretty much blatant 6,000 year old creationism from what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we don't have too much of drive there. I mean, obviously Darwin being British. I mean, we had Darwin on our banknotes. We had, Dar we, we had Darwin on our money. You guys have, um, in God We Trust, we had the founder of um, <laughs> Theory of Evolution on ours. Um, 
So that's not to, not to be detracting or anything. You've got beautiful money. It looks very, very nice. <laughs> Although I can never tell how you managed to tell them apart in the dark, all being the same size. <laughs> in, uh, you know, yeah. our banknotes go from small to large depending on the denomination. So, you know, when you've got a 20 pound note, you know, you're holding a 20 pound note. Um, but, uh, dr- yeah, don't you know, just I, pop uh, out a ruler and <laughs> measure it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We always carry one on our, on our, um, keychains. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> just for that specific an occurrence, just to make sure that I've, we are carrying a twenty pound note. I've never tried to figure out what a denomination was in the dark. There's always been enough light. Like in a cab, you, you turn on the dome light. Uh, if you're at a bar, there's always some light by the the cash register. No, fuck that. Who's use, who's uses cash? I'm like plastic credit card right there. Yeah, well, I, I rarely use card. rarely use cash anymore. I use mainly use my debit card, except for buses and things like that where they kind of want change, exact change. Except for in London, where they've introduced this, uh, or I think all public transport in London, you have to use an Oyster card. You can't just pay with cash anymore, which on the one hand seems really convenient. On the other hand, I wonder how it affects people who maybe only have the exact change for a bus, but not enough money to top their car. I don't know. I I used to use a a RFID card over in Japan for uh, trains all the time, and it worked like a champ. I actually loved it. Well, we're quite... Transport in Edinburgh is really good. I think Lothian buses have been frequently voted the best in the country. Um, and it's quite decent. I mean, uh, I can go from where I am in Preston Pans, travel a 90 minute journey to the other side of town, and it won't cost me any more than £1.50. So like $2.50 or something like that, um, mm-hmm. for a 90 minute journey on the bus. Cause it's, it's just a flat fare of £1.50 regardless mm-hmm. of distance um, in Edinburgh, which is really, really good. It's really, really nice. You don't have to fumble around and think about where you're going. You just put the 150 in, say, single ticket, please, and you sit down. Um, it's for little things that impress me, being British. You know, our transport, <laughs> si- our transport system, you know, jolly good. Trains one day will run on time, but uh, that day is not today. <laughs> but our buses are good. We've got Wi-Fi on our buses. Come on, that's the future. All right, that's wow. kind of cool. All right, I'll give you that. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Everybody has to be able to play their, you know, clash of clans or whatever it is while they're right on the bus. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very, very important. Um, although we've got yeah. good 3G coverage as well. So that's fine. You know, we're, we're, we're switched on here. I think there's a, there was an experiment done. I'm not entirely sure. One of the cities tried to make a section of it entirely Wi-Fi accessible as well. I think, I think mm-hmm. for some reason I want to say Glasgow. Um, but I might be talking complete and total nonsense and that absolutely making it up maybe i don't know but I, I seem to hear remember hearing something like that that there was going to be an experiment to try and wi-fi eyes an entire city mm. they've done something like that with san francisco uh it's uh, one of the baltic countries uh, i think it was estonia or, or latvia they have made their entire country covered on a national wi-fi network wow well, that's that's and that's the way forward really that's what's going to be happening now um granted we, that country was tiny so yeah <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's a step. It's a step yeah. in the right direction. Uh so I can see just the future's very quickly catching up on us. I mean, I only got a smartphone a couple of years ago after they've been out for about four or five years. So I'm frequently a little bit behind with technological advances. Uh, but I like to give them time to see whether or not they're gonna stick. You know, when Google Glass came out, I thought, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. But let's see what happens with it. And I've now decided no. <laughs> it doesn't seem to have taken off that much. It sound well, that was only a beta program alpha program really it was, it was nothing really meant for the public yet right okay so it's, it, oh, okay it's, they're they are definitely wanting to take that further um i'll be honest i do actually have a smart watch um moto 360 and that that you know i don't have to i don't have to bother with my phone hardly ever anymore unless i want to actually like play a game on it right okay how practical are they because the screens i've seen look kind of small uh i'd say it's Almost an inch and a half across. It, it's very usable, very readable. Daylight, any any place. I can send text messages from it, reply to text. Um, mm. It it shows me all my alerts and any kind of uh, appointments, plans. Shoot, it even shows me directions, uh, GPS directions on the screen. Yeah, that's the great thing about the advent of smartphones, isn't it? We you can no longer make the excuse of "sorry, I got lost." Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's all down. On the phone, I was reading, because I'm, you know, a millennial, I think that's what I am, Generation Y, 
1983. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, I think, I think, I think generation Y is what early 80s, or early 2000s. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, it's quite useful just to have that. And I was reading these memes on the internet because that's what we do in our generation. Mm-hmm. We spend the night reading memes. And, uh, one of them was just talking about how nobody says the phrase, where are you anymore? Um, because we know, you know, we're, we're, um, we know, Sorry, no, that's the other way around. I'm being an imbecile here. It's the other way around. We now say the phrase, where are you? Because before we had to know where people were in order to call them. So we knew they were at home. We knew where they were. Whereas now, yeah. with smartphones, it's like, where are you? Oh, well, I'm in France. Why? Oh, no, I had a bit too much to drink. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great story in the papers a while ago. A guy who did that. He got drunk and woke up in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> that That sounds like an awesome night. No matter what, that was a great night. Yeah, it does sound great, although you have to kind of think about how long it would take to get there, and at one point he must have sobered up enough to go, ah, crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, wow. That, that's the kind of story that you're going to be, you know, talking about or laughing about with your friends for, well, a decade. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be one of those great things. Um, where are you going tonight? Uh, just out to the club? In Britain or in mainland Europe? I haven't decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you when I get there. Tell you in the morning. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. If I come uh, back and it's mainly euros in my wallet, you'll know what's happened. <laughs> I've heard of people in Boise waking up drunkenly in Utah or Nevada, and yeah, you know, we're talking five six hour drive. But wow, getting into a different country—that's that's impressive across the body of water. That's that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never done anything like that. I think the closest I came was one night. Me and a friend were doing a film recce where we were trying to find some locations and we decided it was be a good idea to try and walk to Birmingham, which is about 40 miles away from where we were. Right. Um, I, th- I think we made it a couple of miles before we decided this is a really, really stupid idea. And we went home <laughs> and we had orange juice. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how rock and roll we are. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, you're you're definitely showing off your your badassness right there. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was just it was it was, it was good fun. It was a good night. It was, it was when I was a lot younger though, so you know, none of those days now. Um, you know, I get I get annoyed if I have to get you know getting a bus home. It's like oh, it's so long to get home now. I just want to be in my bed with a cup of tea. Oh, <sighs> I'm getting old. The tea, the tea. Oh, my oh the tea. Yeah, I was extremely excited recently when I bought myself a new teacup. <laughs> um, th- that is the most English thing I think I've ever said. I, I went online, I bought myself a new, a China tea cup and sauce, and I got a new teapot, um, tea strainer, and I went and bought a load of loose tea, and I was so excited for it to arrive. When it arrived, I quickly gave it a wash out, and I filled it up, and I was like, I'm gonna have proper tea. Um, <clears throat> so I only, I only have about six or seven varieties of tea in the kitchen, so it's not that bad. Um, you know that you needed a nicely gold plated spoon so that it doesn't, Tint the flavor of the tea. Ah, well, I'll have to add that to my list then. That's the next thing to get. Gold, <laughs> gold plated spoon. Um, I already, I'm already distraught because I don't have a milk jug. Um, <laughs> and I need, I need a milk jug. I was just, I was so frustrating having to use like a, a little mixing jug for my milk. I just felt such a barbarian. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one of the secrets that the, the really chubby ice cream tasters use at the ice cream factories, wherever they're at. Gold, you know, mm. gold spoon so that it, it doesn't, tint the flavor of the ice cream oh fascinating i'll have to possibly get one i think and, and yeah. what, what's this this milk jug because <laughs> in the u.s a milk jug is what you buy the milk in the, the plastic thing it's just the, the fridge container or the paper thing it's just a little pouring jug it's just oh. a little tiny jug that you have you know a little bit of serving of milk in that you can add to your tea a little baby oh. giraffe of some sort yeah a little baby thing and mm. uh that's that's all it is uh mm. so we just kind of have that for our milk um, yeah, it's just nice to kind of sit there and have the whole tea set in front of you. Your milk's um, what just, you put in your cereal, you know, not in your beverage. Yeah, you got you guys do tea wrong. Um, <laughs> what's all this iced tea nonsense? What are you doing? <laughs> oh, you know, I, I know the whole Boston Tea Party was supposed to be an act of rebellion, but, you know, come on, guys. You just, you're, you're messing up. Uh, age old tradition and institution. <laughs> you have to boil the tea and pour some water and some loose tea or maybe tea bags, um, into a teapot and let it brew for a little while. Then add a little bit of milk into your tea cup and then add the tea from the pot. And that's a big controversy as well, whether we put the milk in before we add the water and tea or whether we do it afterwards. Well, the correct way to do it is if you're using a tea 
teacup and a teapot. You should put the milk in first because it allows the teacup to kind of defend itself against oh, the heat from the from the teapot. But if you're just making it in a bag in a cup, then you put the water in first, then you add the milk. Um, but this is a, a constant source of debate in England and Scotland and across the UK. And I believe it was one of the contributing factors to the English Civil War. Hmm. See, just a big cup of hot water, a fucking baggie of PG tips and a little bit of uh, honey. I'm good. PG tips. Mm. PG tips, what am I, common? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's the finest Twinings Earl Grey in this house. I, 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 <laughs> certain... I picked PG tips up off of uh, Mike. Hall. Yeah, t- PG, PG tips are great. I love PG tips. They're yeah, fantastic. So, um, they so I'm sure that would the... be fighting words with you and Mike Hall if that ever came to life. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if I'm going to go for a non-specialty tea, I'll go for a Yorkshire tea. Much stronger <laughs> brew. Mm. Um, certainly. Although, you know, pushing it, maybe Thai food. Um, but PG tips are, they are good quality tea. So if you're drinking PG tips, you are doing tea pretty well. And doing tea pretty British. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although then you have the big debate of whether you add honey or whether you add sugar to it. And then if you're not going to add milk, are you going to add maybe add a little bit of lemon to it? You know, it's this Mm. important question. The big questions in life all revolve around tea. (laughs) Yeah. I'll be honest. I do, uh, have milk in, in my tea, depending on the variety. Uh, we're not going to put yeah. milk in green tea, but if it's no, no, no. Of course, Earl Grey or or a uh, like South Asian tea, uh, a little yeah, bit of milk exactly. is, is quite good. Yeah, Back. black teas are quite good for yeah. Uh, Ice tea is a very wonderful thing in the summertime. Oh, it is refreshing. I've ch- I've tried iced tea. Um, it a, made me a good cry. black tea with a good shot of lemon over ice, really good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm. you know, a, a black tea. Over here would tend to, you would add a little drop of milk, uh, paler tea like chai or something. Mm. I don't always add milk to a chai. Um, sometimes just have it by itself because I'm a rebel. <laughs> uh, luckily, all the chai places around me have gone the way of the dodo. Oh, I've, that, I've, that's where all the hip, the, the dirty hippies went. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've only recently kind of been introduced to chai tea um it's a little too adventurous for my english tastes <laughs> and i, I thought i i thought I'll, I'll give it a try you know i'll move f- forward into the future and i'll give chai a, ta- a chai a try uh, try saying that drunk and uh i i admit i love it it's not tr- it's not a drink i can have every day you know maybe once or twice a month i can have a nice cup of chai tea um <clears throat> but is it i do quite like it um, although my favorite is a blend of Earl Grey and Assam. If you mix the two together, it's quite a nice taste. Then mm. again, to, to, you know, just so I can share, um, I'm actually drinking a energy drink with a bunch of synthesized bulges in it right now. Anyways, <laughs> that's fantastic. I just had, um, well, I've just had a coffee. I thought I'm coming on an American, um, podcast talk show. I should, you know, get in character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tor- you know, taurine. Yeah. <laughs> nom, 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 There's nom, nothing nom. wrong with a good, nothing wrong with a good cup of coffee. I like a good cup of coffee. Um, gets the day going, gets the bowels moving, you know. That's what it does. Yeah. yeah. Braces you for the day, it does. <laughs> then you have a nice cup of tea in the afternoon, maybe with some little cakes, Battenberg or something. Or if you're being really um, crazy and out there, maybe a little French French fancy, um, something like that. You know. French fancy? That's <laughs> living... like cat food. <laughs> oh, if you've not, I don't know, you, I'm sure you probably have them in the States. You probably call them something, something different. Um, the digestives? But French fancies, they're, no, it's a little square cake, um, with a little dollop of, of kind of cream on top, covered in icing. Oh. Huh. Huh. It is lovely. It's a little, it's a little dinky thing. It's a little, you know, lovely little thing you would expect to see in maybe a, a country manor or something like that. Okay. Well, yeah, you are when speaking you go, when you... to my inner fat man. So. <laughs> Oh, we're, we're very good at our cakes over here. Yes, lots of cakes and uh, biscuits. Oh, could really go for a chocolate hobnob right now. You need to search out the American graham cracker. Oh, um, what are these? I'm sure I've had something. I'm sure we, I've had some. What is it? What is that? That is a... Sounds familiar. What? Like a, a, a sweet uh, wheat cracker, usually a, l- a lot of cinnamon built into it, a little bit of honey flavor, usually. Uh, I'm just having a look now. Oh, I, yes. I love dipping, dipping them in milk. Yes, I have had one of those. Or a proper s'mores. Mm-hmm. Oh, Yeah, s'mores. that's where you put, put uh, marshmallows in. Marshmallows in this, isn't it? and a little bit of Hershey's chocolate. Ooh, Make a sandwich out of it. Get the marshmallow all melty, the chocolate melty, yeah. And if you're really adventurous, put a strip of bacon in there. Oh, that sounds amazing. Ooh. 
that sounds i'm not i'm not sure i'm not sure how uh, whether that sounds absolutely fantastic or catastrophic it's one of the two <laughs> um <laughs> It, it depends on your cholesterol level, but yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, probably not a good idea for me. I, I've seen a lot of chocolate shops over here that have like that amazing thick slice uh, maple smoked bacon that's been dipped in chocolate, and you just eat that off a stick. Mm. It, wow. Trust I'm not me, that, how, that would be amazing. I'm not sure how to respond to this. It sounds like some sort of weapon of mass destruction. Only to your heart. <laughs> uh, it sounds very <laughs> bacon and chocolate. That's the sweet and salty, man. It you're, you're starting to hit yeah. into that umami uh, territory. Yeah, I don't know. We have some kind of weird combinations, but I don't know if I've ever gone that far. I have to try it. That does sound. That does sound good. That sounds very. Actually, it does sound. It sounds very American. One of the desserts we're going to have at the wedding is uh, maple bacon eclairs. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I'm so glad I'm coming. And we're also getting some uh, bacon rosebuds. I don't right. know how to respond to that. Yeah, I'm a little bit lost as well. It's it's um, bacon wrapped up to look like a rosebud. Oh, well, all right. Oh, okay. And it's still wonderfully delicious candied bacon. Uh, or uh, bacon bacon with uh, candied jalapenos. Ooh. Have you ever have you ever tried um, uh, rock? That's what we call it over here. It's kind of basically solidified pure sugar. Really <laughs> yeah, rock, rock candies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. I, I whenever I used to go away to Scarborough with my grandparents, they had in the shops a variety of rock in different shapes, and you get this little plate that had um, rock, but it was kind of shaped like an English breakfast. So you had a little egg, <laughs> you know, a little bacon, a little sausage, um, but made of rock, and it was absolutely, it was amazing. Um, terrible, terrible thing to give to children, but absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, the, it's a very much an English tradition. When you go away to the seaside for for a few days, you you buy sticks of rock to bring back for everybody, um, and then have none to give because you've eaten them all on the journey home. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we have in the Pacific Northwest is honey sticks, and whatever the bees eat on, it passes the flavors on to the to the honey. And okay. you have like clover, blackberry, raspberry, fireweed, tons of different flavors. Can you get those in little? straws that are sealed off pinched off at the ends and so you have this little tube of honey and that's one wow, of the things that... i love giving to people i'm not a big honey fan but that does sound very very good they are amazing it, it's a oh yeah it does sound very nice indeed yeah <laughs> so mm. not quite the show you were thinking of was it? yeah it's kind of gone nice. off in all sorts of different directions hasn't it um kind i think like the, the, the skepticism angle was kind of maybe five minutes um <laughs> of me kind of just talking about well you know i kind of did this one thing once with this chap and then there's this other thing um <laughs> but sweets <laughs> um no, we've, we've had some interesting discussion yeah. about uh you know the current state of uk politics on which i'm probably entirely wrong and you'll find someone who'll correct me on every little point there um and you know a little bit of we just could bring it back to uh tony blair and the, the hitchens debate that was just an amazing was- smackdown that was fantastic. I'm. He was outclassed in every single way. He was. He, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've seen it now, but I do remember that one of his opening arguments was one of the it's kind of an argument that's constantly been uh, debunked. And it, he, from what I remember seeing, he was arguing in the same way as a kind of first time debater might argue on Facebook, rather than <laughs> this high profile, in you know, debate. And yeah, Hitchens absolutely wiped the floor with him. As a former um, head of statesman, you would think he would do better. Yes, but what we have to remember is that he had all his speeches written for him. <laughs> mm. I'm sure so he yes, had that one written for him, too. Yeah, yeah, but obviously not by the same people who mm. managed to write him such winning speeches to get him into power. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, that was a fascinating debate. I do enjoy... I, I don't do it much anymore. I'm not as active or as outspoken as an, as an atheist as I maybe used to be. Um, I think that's cause, because I think in, in the UK, I think skepticism is a bigger scene, a bigger community than atheism is. I um, mean, you have the humanist societies that kind of exist, but I think skepticism and skeptics groups are a lot more active on very many issues. Like the Merseyside skeptics have organized a lot of high profile, in some cases, international events. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. There. <clears throat> a few years ago, one of the biggest things they did was the 1023 campaign. Mm-hmm. Oh, we, we, we crunched a whole bunch of horrible tasting stuff ourselves for that. Fantastic. 
Yeah, excellent. Uh, for those who, who might not be aware, um, it was a campaign against um, <coughs> raising awareness of homeopathy and at a specific time on a specific day in cities all over, originally just all over the UK, but then it kind of spread and there was people all over the world doing it. We stood outside of Boots the Chemist and overdosed on on uh, homeopathy uh, to try and raise awareness of it. That was fantastic. That was really, really good fun to do. Um, we did it here in Edinburgh and we had quite a decent turnout. We had a good turnout. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really great thing that, that Merseyside did. And they do a lot of really, really good things. They are one of the most active skeptics groups. If not in the UK, then in the, you know, maybe further along in the world, they are that active. They do a lot of things that gets a lot of attention and they're a really good group. Yeah, definitely. From homeopathy to 1023 to like the, the choosy bands. Uh, yeah, they've done some amazing things, and I would love to see more of that activism here. Um, mm. Well, I think how, s- some of it is, in the UK, religion mm-hmm. isn't the dominant form of woo, so it makes yeah. more sense to branch out, whereas in the US, it is religion. Yeah, I guess yeah. I guess so. I guess that's where, uh, because I've certainly noticed that, uh, speaking to people from America, um, when you kind of discuss online people tend to get a lot more riled up about religion and tend to be a lot more outspoken in their criticism of religion. And I guess that religion just has more of a vocal and more of an impact on people in the States, I guess, especially because you've got that whole separation of church and state thing, um, which we kind of don't really have here. Uh, but then again, we're also a very secular country in practice, mm-hmm. if not on paper. Uh, so, you know, like I said, even the religious people in the UK have a habit of saying, oh, be quiet, please, to the more outspoken ones. I mean, there's a church here in Edinburgh, uh, St. John's Church, and they always have these murals up once a month on the outside of their church. And it's always something very, very progressive. During the gay marriage debate, they had a, a wonderful mural up of two men uh, getting married, and it just said, you know, love has no gender. That's awesome. And, you know, that was a, that was a church in the centre of one of the main cities of the UK. That was just absolutely fantastic that they did that. And it's not uncommon to find, you know, people pretty high up in religious organizations who will have similar views. I mean, of course, of course, there are people who take opposite views. I mean, we've only just now, in 2014, 2015, had our first female bishop. Hmm. And of course, we have something here that you don't have in America. We have the House of Lords, um, which kind of can have the final say on certain laws. And there is an unelected group of bishops who sit in the House of Lords. Uh, so we we do have that, uh, but generally speaking, religion isn't that big of a, a deal here in the UK. Um, people don't really get as passionate about it. But that's again, that's kind of just my perception of things. Um, speak to someone else, you might see something else. I mean, there are groups and there are people who do believe Christianity is under attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they again, they're a very small but vocal group. Um, yeah. You know, in, in my neck of the woods, my atheist society, atheist group is basically the same group of people as our skeptic society, society. It's basically the same group of people. And we, and there's a lot of overlap in our area. And we do like, uh, we've helped with, uh, getting gay marriage, uh, legalized in our state. Oh, marriage fantastic. Equality, and fantastic. taking on a lot of other, you know, skeptic issues, um, Usually not Fantastic. under not under the banner of atheism, under the banner of skeptics, but it, you know it's again still the exact same group of people. Yeah, so, um, and again here you'll see a lot of crossover within the groups. Um, I know a lot mm-hmm. of people from the Edinburgh Humanists who come to the Edinburgh Skeptics and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so there is a crossover, but you also do find even in, you know in the skeptics groups around the UK, you will find people who align themselves maybe as ag- agnostic theists, or in some cases, you know. Gnostic theist, um, who mm-hmm. still embrace skepticism on other areas and other levels. So there is a, it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a welcoming. I, I like to think it's a welcoming atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and kind of all we ask is that you, you know, you are willing to question things. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't done much of the reaching across the, the aisle, but we're, we're working on that too. Because sometimes those religious people can definitely be allies. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mm-hmm. do get a little annoyed when you see things, especially on Facebook and Twitter, of people outright condemning all religious people as morons. And I, I, I don't, that doesn't sit too well with me because for start off, it's not true. A lot of very, very intelligent people are religious. The chap who mapped the human genome is a Christian, sure. uh, for example. I, I just think they have a lot of cognitive dissonance going on, which, you know, if we can either 
you know, mock them a little bit or give a little bit of play, playful uh, derision or, you know, some little bit, little bit of thoughtful discussion and maybe, you know, help that conversation along. Yeah, I think uh, thoughtful discussion is a good route to go. I think if, well, it because you'll find that person. most. Sometimes you need the cajoling, sometimes you don't. Yeah, I, th- I think um, there's a lot of people that if we actually did speak a little bit more um, to other groups, and you know, you would find there's a lot of religious people who agree with a lot of sceptical issues because definitely, I think a lot of sceptics tend to be left leaning. Yeah. Um, not not exclusively, but sure. ones I know certainly tend to be a bit more left leaning, <clears throat> and I don't think that is a political position or social position unique to skepticism. I think you have people of all walks of life, of all religious beliefs, along the political and social line. Definitely. And I think um, some of the strongest voices we can have in campaigning against, you know, sorry, campaigning for things like equal marriage, if that's coming from religious voices, I think that adds a really strong um, uh, or really strong voice to the discussion. Especially when you do get people who follow religions a little more, a little bit more um, evangelically who will say well you know god says it's one man one woman to then have someone who is also religious come out and say no i don't accept that that does not represent what i believe i think mm-hmm. is a very powerful thing to have definitely you know not just religious voices but just a deafening cacophony from every fucking direction yeah the more <laughs> people you can get from the wider variety i think the stronger your voice is because if it's just people who align with one particular ideology you maybe lose a little bit of um of loudness of noise but if you've got people from all walks of life from all persuasions coming together to actually protest something to actually raise a stink about something to actually show their support for something i think you've got a very very good group of people because it's showing the diversity there it's showing that actually we are a diverse society and we are an accepting and welcoming society and we want to be moving in this direction and that the people who speak out against it are in the minority and they are going to be consigned to history in the same way as people have now been consigned to history when they were talking about interracial marriage. Yeah. And you mm-hmm. hear almost the, the exact same things between you do. marriage you, and interracial marriage from 50 years ago. You do. There was a wonderful YouTube clip I watched recently um, of a, it was an American chap, and I believe he was a, a priest or a vicar or something along those lines. And he came to talk at a equal marriage debate. And he came forward to give his voice and he started talking about how um, homosexuals were, you know, unbiblical and ungodly and this that, and the other and he got about three quarters of the way through and then he said and this is why i'm in favor of segregate oh no i'm sorry i've <laughs> I, i've been reading this charter from 1955 about interracial marriage and i just switched the phrases interracial marriage with gay rights I've and you can see that. the arguments I've seen that video yeah. and that it is an a amazing. wonderful video you can see how nervous he is as well during the reading of it because he is for the first three quarters saying something that is deeply controversial and deeply offensive oh, um and at any point you know someone could have shouted and shut him down um so you know he was had you know big brass cojones for kind of doing that and going through with it and that it was just a great thing to see and i think it shows that it doesn't really matter what your religious beliefs are um we can all come together when it's necessary to push these things through to to stand up and say hey we don't think that this type of inequality is right in the 21st century god damn yeah <laughs> <laughs> feel free yeah, to put that won't... on posters and memes and stuff if you wish <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah you won't hear any debate about that for me <laughs> yeah and yeah and i live in a state where there's a a, a bill that just got proposed in the legislature uh, calling for the impeachment of any judges who have ruled in favor of marriage equality. See, I and, don't understand how being called um, <clears throat> a lefty or being called liberal, I don't understand how that's an insult. Yes, I'm liberal. I believe in equality socially, economically, politically for all people. Um, why is that a bad thing? But then again, you know, I'm sure you'll get some conservatives who take the position of, well, why is my position automatically a bad thing? And I guess that when it that comes down to the arguments and the debates and how we develop as a society um, as deciding that. Mm-hmm. Well, when you have, uh, from what I can tell, the vast majority of Republicans, uh, right-wingers, saying that, you know, they're anti-abortion, but once the kid's born, fuck off. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we still have um, abortion debates and discussions in the UK. Um, mainland Britain, it's less prominent, but I know in Northern Ireland there's still controversy over abortion and there's debates going on about whether or not 
women can have access to abortion under certain situations and conditions and things like that. But this thing is starting to move forward. It's starting to move ahead. Um, and, you know, even our right-wing conservative party, they're the party that bought in marriage equality. You know, mm-hmm. for whatever bad things David Cameron and the conservatives might be remembered for, they're the party, they're the group that bought in marriage equality. And I, I, th- I don't think maybe our conservative party is maybe as right-wing as your Republican Party might be. Yeah. Um, you know, there's still things I disagree with with conservatives, and there are still conservative members of Parliament who will stay, still say, no, no, I don't believe in this, I don't think we should have had marriage equality. You'll still get that, of course you will. But generally speaking, when, you know, your m- most right-wing mainstream party is advocating marriage equality, I think, <laughs> you know, that's, that is a step forward. Yes, it is. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, I think we're running out of time. Uh, this has been a, a real blast. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been good to kind of talk about a few things. Um, yeah, it's been great. I'm just now kind of kind of thinking back over everything I said. I'm thinking, right? Should I have said that? Should I have said that? Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, so I always I always do that with interviews. I always think I probably <laughs> overstepped the boundaries with something and said something I probably shouldn't. Shouldn't I said something daft or silly? But I think I think I've been pretty um, pretty liberal with yeah. uh, with what I've been saying. I think I've uh, yeah. I thought you did quite well. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'll be interesting to kind of hear this back and hear what kind of stays in and what does kind of get cut down. <laughs> not um, much. Not much. We'll just, we'll just excise that entire tea section, you know, <laughs> bloody English people ranting about tea. Oh, no, if that's I wanna add, If I want to oh, add ice to my tea, I will add ice to my tea. No, <laughs> no, no, don't do that. You're doing bad. Uh, do you have anything right. you'd like to plug? Yes, actually. Um, <clears throat> if you do happen to find yourself in the United Kingdom, between uh, May and June of this year, I'm touring a show. And it's called How to Talk to the Dead. And uh, well, talking to the dead is pretty easy to do. Uh, getting them to talk back is where the problem comes in, and that's the purpose of the show. It's looking at some of the things that were done in the late 19th and early 20th century by mediums and by people who organise seances to try and convince you that they could talk to the dead when actually they weren't and so we'll be looking at things like the origin of the Ouija board where that comes from we'll be having some demonstrations of table levitations and some spirit slate demonstrations I'm even going to bring up some ectoplasm um, which always makes a mess and tastes foul <laughs> uh, so it's, it's going to be good fun and that's going to be taking place in June uh, sorry May and June and it's been done at skeptics groups uh, around the UK uh, there's about 20 dates on that and I've got two more later on in the year as well uh, so it's going to be quite active and that's you can kind of find out more information about that my website is currently not playing ball for some reason but you mm. can go to ashleyjamespryce.wordpress.com and that's Price with a Y and Ashley is A-S-H-L-E-Y uh, so ashleyjamespryce.wordpress.com and you can find out more information about that there you can also follow me on Twitter at Ash Price and uh, search for me on Facebook as well Ash Price alright now I'll be in the show notes Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And and if either of us ever come to the UK, can we have a couch to crash on for a little bit? I'm sure I'm sure we can sort that out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we can probably put you up. Might even be able to stretch to an airbed. Mm. We're nice. fancy in this household. Wow. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> awesome. You'll have to put up with the noise of my Daegu's though. They can be quite chirpy in I'm the sorry. early hours. Sorry. Daegu's. Daegu's. Um kind of like a imagine a a Sounds giant like a racial imagine- slur, man. I don't know. <laughs> imagine a... It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, imagine a large gerbil mating with a rat, and you've kind of got a Daegu. Right. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I'm part lovely. Italian, so I'm thinking Daegu. Uh, you know, right, a, yeah. A Daegu wop, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. no, completely different things. These are um, beautiful little... I think this Daegu's are beautiful, beautiful little creatures. Um, very, very intelligent. I think they're smarter than, smarter than rats. Kind of like a ferret? Um, nothing like a ferret. <laughs> okay. Daegu. They're, they're kind of like a ferret in all the ways that they are not. I mean, they're, still, they're still a rodent. But yeah, they're beautiful little things. Um, they've only really just become popular as pets um, in the past few years. Um, but they're, they're gorgeous. Make a lot of noise, though. They, they cheer up and talk to each other, and we have no idea what they're saying. Well, I think they're conspiring against me. Oh, God, it looks like a weird beaver... <laughs> beaver thing. That is the most ugliest thing ever. Could you spell that again? D E G U. D E G U. Have a look at the images and tell me they are not cute. 
Oh, okay. That was a naked mole rat. Okay. <laughs> Completely different animal. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, naked mole rats are ugly little things. Um, <laughs> bless their cotton socks. All right. I will be sure not to show this to my fiance because <laughs> she, she likes cute things. And yeah, we have enough animals in this house already. Yeah. They are, you know, they are lovely. And you can see them, like, they kind of sleep together in this little ball. <clears throat> it's the cutest thing ever. And then they fight, and it just makes a mess. So, oh. <laughs> we've had to separate one of them because he was trying to take on the alpha male and kept getting his, uh, his tail handed to him. So okay. he's, he now, he now has to live by himself, but he's got a little mansion, so that's fine. Okay. A little two story kind of daegu mansion. Somewhere between a, a, a squirrel and a rat somehow. Yeah, it's an, it's an odd creature, isn't it? They're sometimes called sand rats. Um, huh. or, or desert rats, sorry. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're odd little things. They've kind of got gerbil coloring, kind of a, a, a rat's face. Um, and then a kind of a podgy little hamster body. I think they're a result yeah. of some genetic experiment gone wrong, personally. Uh, that's, uh, it's called South America. Right. <laughs> South America had amazing diversity of rodents. Uh, Including some at some points getting you know insanely huge uh, until they finally got uh, some big cats from from North America that went in and slaughtered all the big ones, but they still have a wide variety of of rodent uh, diversity, and uh, this is a horrible uh, byproduct of that. You say horrible, I say cute and goodly. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay a, an adorable <laughs> byproduct of it, yeah. An adorable byproduct, yeah. They are, they are fantastic little things. Um, they hate me, but, you know, it's not, it's not, that's not a problem with them. It's clearly a problem with me. <laughs> Actually, they just don't like tea. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. I think I'll just get rid of them now. Coming out of all these um, that, that's, that's scientific laboratory testing for them now, I'm afraid. That's, that's where they're going. Or perhaps the facial hair reminds them of them, of their uh, <laughs> alpha predators. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly so, yeah. Um, yeah, um, those of you, you know, again, can't see this, obviously, but I have some absolutely wonderful uh, <laughs> 17th century Van Dyke going on with the curly, waxed ends that kind of curl around on themselves. Um, <clears throat> all I need is kind of a monocle and a top hat, and uh, I can sit there drinking my tea on the lawn um, while I occasionally you know, step up and play a bit of bowls or with the croquet. Vel- velvet sm- smoking jacket and everything. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Quoting Wilde and Shakespeare and that type of thing. I mean, that's kind of just like a normal day for most British people, actually. Having we an do just Indian go- manservant. Yeah. No, no, we've, we've progressed beyond that now. We, we pay them. Oh, okay, okay. Well, thank you for having me on. It's been absolutely fantastic to just kind of sit and chat and talk about things. Uh, covered a large variety of topics, haven't we? Um, some of which I'm sure many, many people point out and say, well, he got that wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as is the way when it comes to political discussions. And yeah, I've got the show, How to Talk to the Dead, coming up. Please check that out. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, um, visit my site. And uh, kind of, if you get a chance to come over to the UK, do. It's fantastic. It's wonderful here. The weather is only half as bad as we make it out to be. And believe it or not, <laughs> we've actually been voted number one in the world for dental hygiene. So forget all those myths. All right. <laughs> only about half my teeth are crooked. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Definitely. It's been a blast. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. All right. Well, uh, let's let's do the official start and then a segue to the discussion we just had. Yes. And then we'll move on from there. So let's let's see how well we can do with this. Uh,